I'm here at the New York City boutique of Manolo Blahnik, the legendary shoe designer, and I'm here to sit down with the man himself to talk about his incredible career in fashion. Manolo Blahnik, your name elicits desire, elicits emotion in women around the world. What is it about you, women and their shoes? I don't even know, really. It's one of the things, that perception, I don't, I don't really get it. The perception of, of being desire. all desire, all those things. I, yes, I do know because I mean, I do. But um, and sometimes I see people like taxi drivers saying to me, "Oh, my wife I, on the sale. I bought my wife. Yeah. This is recently. I bought a pair of shoes for her, and she's so happy. She can have treasures." She's, all the times that she did for me the other night. God, I mean, this is if, if my shoes makes this kind of desire. Yes, fine, why not? But what do you think it is? Because I'll tell you, when I mentioned your name to several people from very different demographics around the city, I told the cashier at the pharmacy that I was interviewing you. She went crazy, and she said, "I can't believe it." She said to me, "I saved up and I bought one pair of his shoes, and I treasure them, and I love them." Sweet, I love things. And it's true. But meaning everybody from every demographic, and they. They know you and they get excited. You know, I, I'm What's always been unaware of these things. Actually, I don't have sense of fame or riches or things. I don't really get it. I'm very kind of maybe out of control in that uh, respect. So, what are you considering when you're actually designing your collections? I love to see the women wearing it, of course. But otherwise, it's pointless. But I really like the way they walk. And if I say those things behind, I didn't like it. It's because the tiny heels, I really like heels. But not platforms, heels, proper heels. Because a woman beauty, walks beautifully. The body changes when it undulates differently when they wear high heels. Don't discuss about this with me because I love it. You say you don't like platforms, and no, obviously there's oh been a God, huge trend for platforms for a it's time. Been too long. I mean, but you know this. Why don't you like, like them? I've been going so so long that I did it beginning of the 70s. So I mean, it's nothing new for me. So you obviously have been designing for decades, and you've been successful for decades. Next year, no, next in the 2012. Yeah, next year, 40, 40 years, years. My goodness. Have you seen? And where again those times? You see, it seems to me yesterday. But do you think, you say you feel like you started yesterday. Have you seen your style, your aesthetic evolve over these past almost 40 you years? To, you have to, without being a victim of what is the fashion needs or whatever fashion does, uh, normally I change. I evolve, but subtly, not too much. How has the Manolo Blahnik aesthetic evolved? It's up to you to see because I'm unaware how and how it depends in very small details. The cut, the volume, things like that change. And you cannot do the same thing all the time, so it's boring. So that is possibly the, the change. Do you find yourself responding to trends? Mm, sometimes violently, yes. You respond against trends? Against trends, yes. Always, always a contrarian, actually. In fact, somebody does this thing, I do the contrary. It's so, my nature. So what are women doing now that you feel that, that they should be eliminated? I want to say it again, platforms. Platforms. Yes, definitely. <laughs> platforms. I uh, have repulsion. I don't like it. You say that you like a high... You know, you can get platforms, my God, in Hollywood and you, for the last 40 years and you don't have to move from Frederick, so, um, my God, <laughs> from whatever it is. And this is what kind of aesthetic those kids, from Russia up to Hollywood, they have that kind of... Frags or Hollywood. I mean, it's nothing new. Sure. For me. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But the higher heel, the better. Mm, to a point. High heels, um, with, uh, when it's too high, you just cannot walk. Comfortably or otherwise. So that's possible that they have to put those monstrous uh, yeah. platforms to walk. What about a Manola Blahnik sneaker? What would that look like? We don't have sneakers, but have a driving shoes, actually. Would you ever design a workout sneaker for women to look good at the gym? If somebody just convinced me very, very strongly, maybe, you never know. I never against anything. How about a large line for men? I know you have done selective pieces. Yeah, I mean, men are just less interested than women. In this, in that, you know, they just, we, do, uh, we do Oxfords, we do derbies, we do whatever. But I really like matador pumps. What keeps you inspired year after year? What keeps you fresh year after year? You know, I'm an incurable, curious person. I'm just like, um, oh, I want to see the next thing, the other thing, the other thing. I mean, it's just like, this is what keeps me going. But what are you looking at? What are you reading? What are you watching? Uh, what I'm reading, my God, I'm 19th century now. Totally 19th century cleanup. 
of everybody from uh, l'éducation sentimentale, uh, Balzac, les Pères Goriot, I don't know, so many things, but old 19th century appeals to me because I get lost in the stories. You see, you don't have things like that now, unless it's like maybe one of those modern masters, like, I don't know. The last one who tells stories and I get into it is Norman Mailer. But I mean, I don't know this. I like this boy, Jonathan, Jonathan Safran. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like him. But there isn't many people modern that I like. And they inspire your design. They do. They do. I mean, that is not inspired because I read a page and I say, ah, oh, but they do inspire me, yes. How about movies? <laughs> don't talk about movies. Movies is my passion. I did a movie here today. Um, John Fontaine and Elizabeth Taylor playing the little, the little consumptive girl in the movie 1945 with Orson Welles and John Fontaine and Elizabeth Taylor. She did Suddenly Last Summer, ten, based on Tennessee Williams, um, with the most beautiful set by Oliver Messel. And the costume was so fantastic. And the other day I was doing Godard. I don't know why, I just Godard de Mépris. Uh, the the content is yeah. called with Brigitte Bardot ravishing and Fritz Lang looking wonderful. The last movie appearance of his, it was wonderful. I mean, I love that movies that just transport me to the time and period of those movies. Il Conformista, Alberto Lucci. It's the, my idea of what was in Europe. And you feel like you're traveling back. Today. Traveling back and traveling inspiration. I mean, colors, uh, materials, uh, it's all there. Related to your passion for movies, for movie sets, tell me about your job right before you spoke with a woman named Diana Vreeland. I was in school. I was in university, yes. I was in Geneva and had an uncle who wanted me to be the United Nations when I served. Two summers when I was, I was 17. They put me to do those kind of huge conference and then my job consists in doing the papers every morning I say uh-uh this is not for me this atmosphere is not for me these people just got bad breath and they just smoke and terrible cuts and horrible suits no no I didn't want to be exposed in that world it's boring and so then what were your first steps into the world of creativity it was one of those accidents my life has always been accidents everything I do is an accident I was, uh, I didn't know what to do, in fact. I didn't know what, what was going to be my thing. But for one moment, when I was 17 or 18, I had friends that they do movies, set for the movies, and I want to get into s movies. Why not? I was very good for my hands, and I really loved what, anything to do with camera, cameras and what camera catches or captures. And I wanted to do that, alas. In the meantime, something changed, and I came to America with my friends, and uh, I went to see people like Chino Machado, Mrs. Rillen, and uh, I ended up doing shows. Here we are. So it's an accident. It happened. They saw my drawings for theater I was doing. You know, I don't even know what I was doing. But um, sets. And they say, oh, Mrs. Rillen say, oh, mm, mm, uh, extremities, extremities, and, and here I am. Say, do shoes, do accessories, do anything, they are wonderful. I think it's worked out all right for you. It worked beautifully. I was an accident, I've never been happier. So had that not happened, had you not stumbled upon this incredible <laughs> career, where would you have been today? Frankly, I don't know, maybe selling bananas in my <laughs> father's property or something like that, I don't know. I mean, honestly, that's what my family did at the time, in the 19th century and 18th century. We give bananas because of my islands. Clearly the global economy has had its ups and downs recently. Do you find yourself responding to the economic climate, the societal climates, when you're designing your collections? Maybe in one thing. I cannot use very expensive crocodiles, the lo those beautiful Louisianas, and I cannot use embroidery so much because it's like time consuming and prices are horrendous. So maybe it's the only time I do little Tweak here, tweak here. But, but uh, no, I cannot do, I cannot control myself. And I'm using brocade, so from Lyon, so in silk. So not I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't think it's what people need now, but I, I, I felt that I have to do it. Have you ever considered going down the path that so many other designers have gone down to create a more accessible diffusion line? <laughs> it's tempting, but I just. First of all, I do work on my own. I don't have assistants. I have just, I have the old boys cutting and things like that because I hate numbers and I hate sizes and things like that. But um, somehow, uh, 
I found it, I love to do it because it's like you can see it in everybody and things like that, it was exciting, but phew, I'm not ready for this thing. My God, when I'm going to be ready when I just drop? I mean, no, 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 it's, um, no. I don't think, I don't think it's my, my, I've been off a million times, yes. thousands, millions and things, and um, I'm not into money really, no. Well, clearly many, many people around the world still associate your brand with Sex in the City. What did that show mean for your company? It means a lot. Are you kidding? I mean, without this uh, extraordinary exposure by Miss Parker and Miss Field, uh, I wouldn't be selling so much in places like nobody had of me in South America or whatever. Yes. People come to me in Brazil and say, oh, I'm going to go to Malt Sex in the City. Oh, you know this nonsense. And they always sort of talk to me about Sex in the City. They're going to put in my tombstone, um, Madonna, Squad, uh, Sex, whatever it is you say, and Sex in the City. This boy did Sex in the City. Oh, God. <laughs> you have to laugh. Many consider Carrie Bradshaw and Sarah Jessica Parker to be iconic women. You've worked with many, many, many iconic women over the years. Who's been your favorite? Nowadays, very few. I mean, Miss Parker, I like Julia Roberts. It's true Hollywood. It's still the faces that I, and I adore that woman, Angelina Jolie, because she's divine. It's beautiful body, beautiful face. But I don't remember anybody else. I tried to, then I love beauties. I mean, actresses like Laura Linney and things like that. I do love those girls. And, but I'm not uh, modern actors. Um, they're less interesting than my kind of idea of what cinema should be, which is in monsters, beauties, I mean, completely overpowering women. Like, I mean, somebody said the other day to me, who is Norma Shearer? I just like spelled, like giving a slap in the face. Norma Shearer was one of the divine women in the 20s and the 30s. Even Sujit Romeo and Julia when she was 45 or 42. Can you imagine how wonderful she was? I love those kind of Maybe people now tend to associate those kind of, uh, it's too far gone, these ideas. I love those girls, the sirens of Hollywood. They're all Hollywood, yes. With Elizabeth Taylor. This is Elizabeth Taylor, the last one. That's it. What is the shoe design that you most feel connected to, that you feel most inspired by? Maybe you could draw it for us, give us an idea of it. I did a one in for this extraordinary gentleman who's not here in this world anymore, called um, Ozzy Clark. And I did a shoe in, in London, which was my beginning, it could be my end also, because I did a shoe which was like full of cherry leaves and uh, cherry, real cherries. It was incredible. At the time, it was extraordinary. What I year was this? 1970. 70-something. 70 70 70 70 70 70 70 70 70 yes. 70 At the Royal Call Theatre. Uh, I believe here, this is the, the top. And then another ivy here. Uh, uh, well, I don't even know this. It looks like Hollis, but I have it. But anyway, so there's an encroach up here, and this is the, the, the shoe, the whole, the whole thing of the shoe. And this coming up, up, up to the leg with chairs hanging down. I can imagine it was impossible. But this was it made in crepe rubber. Rubber crepe, you call that? Rubber. Rubber, rubber but crepe, white. And I was due to my stupidity and innocence, or whatever it is, not experience. I had this um, when the show started at the Royal Gold Theatre. I say to myself, "Oh my God, this is going to be the end of me now." And the thing finished, and people started to clap, the models and everything. And then people come to me and say, "Oh my God, you gave those girls a wonderful walk, indeed. Their shoes used to move like that because there was nothing inside. I didn't put the steel." You know the steel thing you put inside, but they just keep it. So the feather light. It was shoes. like uh, feather light shoes, now, but the, the movement was like totally like, you know, and they moved divine, actually, in fact. If I, I saw the movie not long ago, and it looked like this. My God, how crazy I was. I didn't have, you know, no idea how to make shoes. Maybe we could bring that back. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think it would be that, <laughs> that fabulous. I don't think so. I'll be bankrupt in two seconds, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here we are. This is the... The ivy, but it doesn't look like ivy, that one. Ivy-ish. Ivy-ish, ivy -ish. but not really. Anyway, so it was an extraordinary time for, for designers. Nobody thought about being, um, now it's everything about money and projection of money and budgets and things. At the time, it was like everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do. 
without being worried about huge companies behind threatening to you. 1972, can you imagine? My God. Here we are. You can have it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That trash, if you want it, put, put it in the oh, bathroom. I think it's beautiful. The footwear industry just gave you its Lifetime Achievement Award, as you probably Lord, noticed. Lord, probably I noticed. felt so strange about this Lifetime Why? Achievement, because it's like I'm gone, like I'm dead. Uh, lifetime Achievement for me is like somebody's uh, very old and, you know, like Bing Crosby or somebody like Fred Astaire or Ginger Rogers in a chair, giving the Lifetime Achievement Award or whatever, just like, uh, it's great, it's a great honor, yes, because it's the industry and everything, but, um, I don't have, mm, mm. Mm. I feel very ambivalent about this kind of achievement because I haven't done what I want to do yet. I have a few years got more to do things that I want to do. What's next um, for Manolo Blahnik? For Manolo Blahnik and the world, <laughs> because I'm telling you the world, I don't even know if it's going to be next too much because <laughs> Europe is like on the edge of something that I don't understand. It's a but problem. A big problem. A big problem. You, you manage, you have incredible, you know what is fantastic? What's that? I do realize that anything made, I, I went to used to buy stuff, uh, underwear at um, somewhere in New York. Uh, the other day I discovered it was made in China. I said, no, I don't want to have anything made in China. It's just a principle. I cannot tolerate that anybody is sending things to China, and everybody does, to make profit and to make this country big and powerful when they should be doing it in the south of America, in south of whatever it is, even Portugal, anything, but not China. China does, I mean, why? Everything is made in China now? I can bear it. Wow. Isn't it awful? This is horrible. This is, um, this is terrible to be like that, but it's the way I feel. So we can be sure Manolo Blahnik will no, never be China. made. No, no, made in China, no. Mr. Blahnik, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>